Good morning. Welcome to Go Church. We're glad you're joining us. Pastor Mark's starting a new series today that we know is going to be a great blessing. So I hope you let God touch your life through this message in this day. Some 
thank you for that incredible time of worship just to meet you here at your church body. Um, Lord, to give us, your heart, give us our hearts and our spirits, um, to surrender everything uh, on the table. Lord, we need this time. Lord, and I've needed this time um, just to come at the end of my week and say, you are still enough. You are all I need. Lord, we, we, we just thank you for being able to do that this morning. Lord, please, um, please help us focus on what you would say through your word being preached this morning to us, how we can apply it. Um, Lord, we know that the interpretation of your word is there's only one, but we know that there can be multiple applications for how you might speak to us and how we might apply what we're hearing today in our lives. Um, Lord, just uh, help us be good listeners today. And uh, just bless our time. Amen. Please be. All right. Well, today I'm going to launch a short series that will either inform you or remind you of who we aspire to be as a church. We're going to spend three weeks on what I believe is God's vision for Go Church. The last time I covered this was 2020, and half of you were not yet here, so I think this will be helpful. Now listen, I know that some of you uh, won't be excited about this series because you were wanting me to launch into the next book of the Bible. And so let me do what we do with our kids and tell you that we will go to McDonald's after we run errands, okay? Uh, I'm going to take the next three weeks to shepherd the church a little bit, to focus on where we are going and who we are becoming. But after that, We're going to launch right into an expository series through the book of Hebrews, okay? We'll cover the entire book. It doesn't get much meat, much more meat and potatoes than that. So there's your happy meal coming right up. If you can just bear with me until then. By the way, I got to say it's pretty cool to pastor a church full of folks who get excited when I'm preaching through Scripture. I love this church. Special church. Now... Is anybody else mad at the world? (laughs) Anybody mad at the world? And I mean, we should hate worldliness, especially our own worldliness. But yes, sin in the world should bother us, no doubt. We should not like the direction things are going in our country, or in the world, and of course, everyone knows that we in the church don't like it. We don't like it at all. Everyone knows that we are mad at the world. Okay. But let's remember that the Bible also tells us that man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. And our other problem is that in reality, we're not as mad at the world as we are mad at the people in the world. I mean, it's not really the world, but the people who live there, if we're honest. And is mad the thing we are supposed to be when it comes to our approach to the people in the world? Here's the thing. Jesus said God is love. And I've been struggling with hatred. Anyone else? I've been angry. Because of the other side of the abortion debate and because of all the gender nonsense, because of pronouns, and because of people don't understand basic economics. So many other things. I'm also frankly resentful And how certain people and groups of people have robbed me of what I once saw as a much greater nation than what I see now. Does that matter to me? Yes, it matters to me. I'm disappointed with the people who changed this thing. I'm mad at the people in the world. But as a follower of Jesus, I'm supposed to love the people in the world. So why has it not occurred to most of us that this is a problem? We do need to start with honesty. I don't know about you, but I am struggling to love whole segments of society right now. I feel anger and disgust, not love. 
This was not nearly so true before COVID and some of the other events of the last three years, by the way. We fast forwarded about 20 years down the wrong trajectory in three years. And while the intensity of the COVID crisis has abated, certain feelings and attitudes have stuck with me. I'm afraid these are feelings and attitudes that are far from loving. I don't want to make light of a very real condition, but sometimes I wonder if just about all of us are struggling with some milder form of group PTSD. What happens if an entire culture has post-traumatic stress disorder? Well, probably nothing good. Among Christians, the effect of this is generally anything but love for the people in the world. Have you noticed? It's worse than ever. We are worse than ever. I'm afraid. Christians are leaving churches that don't hate people in the world enough. And maybe you left a church that really was going off the rails. I don't know, but I want to tell you today that if you're subconsciously looking for a church that does not actually love the people in the world, we are not it. We are not the church, and I'm not the pastor that's wanting to get back at the people in the world whether through our rhetoric or our actions or even our attitudes. Be careful what you bring with you into this fellowship, please. We just got this church started. And I intend to make sure it does not become a toxic waste dump. Clear enough? For the record, I have the same feelings, okay? I have the feelings, my friend. I think we are mostly all in the same place as believers in terms of our emotions. Tell me if I'm wrong. Your primary emotion and your primary approach right now toward the people in the world is anything but love. And what is wrong with this picture? I'll tell you what's wrong with it. The mission of the church is the same as the mission of Jesus Christ. And John 3, 17 says, Jesus came not to condemn the world, but to save it. That comes right after God said He sent Jesus His Son because He loves the people in the world, all of them. And yet, I'm admitting to you that I have felt little love for the people in the world of late. Specifically, I've wanted to run away from people, not run to them with love. Is there anyone here whose primary emotion has been loving feelings toward the people in the world in recent times? Or if, or if you want to talk about love as a verb, which is correct, is there anyone here whose primary choice has been love, even though you don't feel it? If so, I commend you, but I must admit I cannot raise my hand. Not if I'm honest. No, instead, I've been fearful and angry and sometimes maybe even hateful on the inside, which is sinful. I'm mad. I'm frustrated. I'm disgusted. I've not chosen to love the people in the world in the last three years in particular. I'm afraid. Today, I repent. I'm turning around in Jesus' name. If there's one thing God has given me, it's foresight. Sometimes I just feel like I can see down the road. Call it discernment or call it luck. But people who have known me for years will tell you I tend to see what's coming. My point is that I'm not sure I like where we've been headed. I'm called to lead you, to shepherd you, if this is your church. And so again, I need to remind you and myself about love we need to lead each other back to love, church family. I can only hope and pray that the Spirit is leading other pastors to do the same because love is the way the church of Jesus Christ changes the world. Particularly love that shares the good news of forgiveness and eternal life through the power of Christ's cross and His resurrection. Or were you just hoping the other side might die off? Or be wiped out by God? If so, you're just a little bit messed up in your Christianity, friend. We have a mission, and it starts with love. 
not anger or disgust. Listen, our mission is not even to move to another state or away from the city. No, our mission, church, is to love people to Jesus. Folks, there's a, there's a lot at stake. And we have got to do whatever it takes to get back to love. Not everyone agrees. Just before we launched this church almost four years ago, I posted some words on Facebook. There was my first mistake. I posted some words on Facebook about how churches should be known first and foremost for love. Just, you know, that we should be known for love more than anything else. I really thought it was a fairly benign post, but it probably won't surprise you that someone took issue with it and tried to tell me that I have a weak understanding of God's love. He said it's God's wrath and His judgment that the world needs to know about and that the church should be known first and foremost for her stance against sin, not love. Maybe you think he had a point. I'm glad you're here today. By the way, think about where this philosophy leads. Where does it all end? How exactly should we stand against sin? To what extent? Do we need signs or placards placed in front of the place where we meet? Which sins warrant a stronger stance? What does that church look like? How does that church participate with God? Is that church effective? Does that church care whether it's effective or not? Is that church in line with what Jesus did or what he said we should do? The answer is no. I know of a guy who stands in front of church buildings and other places in the city brandishing signs that say things like, God hates you. He sincerely believes God hates the unsaved world, which I guess includes most of us in his mind. Ironically, he thinks very few of us have actually been chosen for salvation, which leaves me asking why he's mad at us or them or why you would bother with the sign since there's nothing any of us unchosen folks can do but wait around to be destroyed in that case. I'm telling you there are plenty of people who believe we are actually far too loving in the church. That really we just need to stand stronger against sin and sinners. As if that accomplished anything or as if that was the mission of Jesus. Some of you might even be on the edge of thinking that way. Understand the emotions that lead there. But let me ask this simple question. Was taking a stand against sin and sinners the mission of Jesus? No. No. Now, Jesus didn't shy away from the truth about sin. But taking a stand against specific sins and sinners was not his mission. Not even close. Let me ask this. Who does the church represent? Jesus Christ. We are ambassadors for Christ to the lost world. It's exactly what the Bible says. We are ambassadors for Christ. Ambassadors sent from him to this world. And looking objectively at the life of Jesus, I'm pretty sure that means we step out with love and care and hope, not fear and anger and hate. Now, make no mistake, Jesus said hard things. But he absolutely led with love, particularly with people you and I would have considered the worst sinners. Jesus led with love. He forgave. He said things like, go and sin no more, but not before he led with love. Get this, Jesus actually loved people. Even bad people. Do we even get that? Jesus loved the people of the world. Do you? truth is that most of the harder stuff Jesus said was for the legalistic religious people. <laughs> like me. Not the lost world. Relationally speaking, Jesus simply did not lead with anger, fear, hate, judgment, or wrath. He led with love. Even in the face of unbelieving sinners, he was sad 
when the rich young ruler walked away. Not angry. Jesus flat out loved people. He cared about them. He loved them, even from the cross, especially from the cross. What then is our problem? Now, I spoke recently about the effort of our current culture to redefine love, which is a big problem. But we cannot surrender or overreact on this point. It's true that love does not mean celebrating and affirming what God has clearly said is sinful and wrong. That is simply not love because it is not true. As I said two weeks ago, true love must be true. Love that lies does not win. Love that wins is rooted in truth because God is love and God is true. Love does not praise evil behavior as good or fail to warn people of the consequences of sin. That's not loving. But listen, even as we hang on to a true definition of love, we still need to remember that Jesus started with love and spoke truth on a foundation of love. Again, Jesus loved the people first. That's what we want to do. We want to start by actually loving the people in our world. Having fun yet? By the way, there's more than one way to tickle ears. Depends on the audience. Think about it. Please take a look at our vision graphic behind me. This is a roadmap that I believe God has revealed, a pathway toward what's going to eventually be true of Go Church. This vision came together in my heart and in my life through the long-term study of Scripture over the last 20-plus years. And I believe this is a, is a vision from God for a church and actually for a family of churches. But first off, it's my prayer and my aim that we become this church. Right now, I want you to notice that this vision is really all about love inside and out. In the center, we start with our why, because of love. And on the outside is our what? Loving God, loving each other, and loving everyone. Inside and out, God's vision for Go Church is all about love. So today, let's start with our why. You'll find it in the center of this vision graphic. Our why, our reason for doing what we do is love. Because of love, we are planting this church. Because we love God and we love people, we wanted to start a new church in Ridgefield. See, we didn't want the people we, who live on our streets and in our subdivisions to stay lost, far from God, or backslidden, or spiritually cold and separated from a local church community. We wanted our neighbors and real people with names and families to find peace with God through Jesus Christ and to join His mission through His church. That's why we started a new church with a focus of reaching those who are not actively involved in some other church already. Because of love, we wanted to see people come to know Jesus and learn to follow Him. That is why we are here. Because of love is also our slogan, sort of the t-shirt version of who we are. In other words, this is the truth about us that we want the world to see first. When people ask why about our church, like, why are we here? Or why do we try to be a blessing in our community? Or why are we going to Nicaragua on a mission trip? Or why would they want to consider being a part of us? We want the answer to come easily. It's because of love. But you might also ask, where will all of this love come from? Do we somehow conjure up this love within ourselves? Do we simply try harder to be loving? Whose definition of love will we use? Will the people we are called to love always make this easy? <laughs> no, this will not be easy, and it will take enormous effort on our part. But step one is to understand that we will not find this special, truthful kind of love in ourselves, nor is a shallow, all-too-human definition of love going to work for our purposes as a church. We will need to love people as God loves people. And see, rather than just being mad and disgusted with them, God was willing to die for them. 
We will need to love people with the love of God, and the only place we can get that kind of love is from Him. Remember this, you will never love people beyond your understanding of God's love. You will never love people beyond your understanding of God's love for you and your understanding of His love for them. Hear that, because this is one of the most important points of theology for the church to understand today. And make no mistake, not every church, not even every Bible-based church has an appropriate understanding of God's love. It is very possible that you do not love the people in the world as you should because you do not fully understand God's love either for you or for them. See, the more you comprehend and have experienced the height and breadth and depth of the love of God, both for you and for other people, the more love you will have to give. God's love is actually limitless, but your understanding, which includes your experience of His love, sets a limit on your own ability to love like Him. That's huge. This works the same with parents and children. Babies learn to love mom and dad and hopefully grandma and grandpa because of the love they receive. Why do they love us? Because we love them. How much do they love us? I will tell you that children love us to the degree that they comprehend and experience our love for them. I believe that's true. Parents who don't express love to their children don't wind up with the most loving kids. Sadly, children who do not experience what it means to be loved do not typically grow up to be loving people. Naturally speaking, they have nothing to give because they never received it. Now, God can redeem such a one into being a loving person, breaking the cycle, but I'm making a point about principle. The principle is that children give back just about as much love as they receive. The baby smiles at you. Why? Because you're smiling at her. The toddler gives you a kiss. Why? Because you gave a kiss to her. Show me a loving child and I will show you a child who is loved. It is the same with God's love and the love we have to give back to Him and to others. God will show you how to love, but only to the extent that you receive and comprehend the love He gives. You will never love people beyond your understanding of God's love, both for you and for them. So, what is your understanding of God's love? Personally, how do you think of God? And specifically, His love. Now, this might surprise you, but some people in some churches do not believe that God loves the whole world. And of course, this misunderstanding goes all the way back to the people of Israel in the time before, during, and after Christ. They certainly did not believe God loved the whole world. They didn't believe that. Not at all. See, they misunderstood what it meant to be chosen. They were chosen, but they misunderstood what that meant. And the misunderstanding continues. Who is my neighbor that I should love? One particular Israelite asked Jesus. And at that point, Jesus told a story about the enemy. The story of the Good Samaritan was shared in answer to who we should love and how we should love as a neighbor. But see, the audience of Jesus didn't think there was any such thing as a good Samaritan. Understand that an appropriate parallel for people in the church to hear today might be something like the good, gay, atheistic member of Antifa. Wait, God loves that person? Yes. So much that if he were here, he might even use them as an example to teach this very church how to love. Jesus chose as his example for love someone associated with a group of people who his audience absolutely did not love. In fact, they hated them. They absolutely hated the Samaritans, and really, they felt righteous in their hatred. They wanted fire and brimstone for the Samaritans. See, the Samaritans were leading others astray. And they didn't follow the law, God's moral code. They were immoral. Hey, they were sinners and they were dead wrong about God and about a lot of things that were important. These Samaritans had the nerve to believe whatever they wanted to believe. And they rejected what the Bible says. But Jesus chose a Samaritan to demonstrate God's kind of love. 
This is the kind of stuff Jesus did that made them want to kill him. Now listen, even Jesus had acknowledged that the Samaritans were wrong, okay? He told the woman at the well that she was wrong about several things. Jesus was aware that the typical Samaritan was far from God, disobedient, and completely in error in his or her beliefs. They were on the wrong team, working against the will of God still. He chose one of them to exemplify the kind of love God wants us to have, the kind of love he has for us. The point was not missed by his hearers, nor should it be missed by us, which is this, God's love is not exclusionary. Whoa. I will equivocate only to add the nuance that there is a certain experience of God's love that is exclusive, reserved for those who become his children by faith in Christ, and yet God excludes no one and certainly no group of people from his general overarching love. In other words, God loves the whole world. I'm pretty sure that's in the Bible. He absolutely desires for everyone to be saved. He also knows that many will never accept his love and forgiveness in Christ, and that grieves his heart. The only way to exclude yourself from the love of God is to reject it until the day you die. As Hebrews tells us, it is appointed a man once to die, and after that, the judgment. Hear those words. After that. After that. After what? After death comes judgment. Every living person still has the opportunity to receive the love of God. Why? Because his ultimate judgment has not yet been declared upon individual people. The gavel has not yet come slamming down if they are living. God is still holding out his love as long as they are still breathing. They have not been officially judged. Judgment comes after death. God is still offering His love and forgiveness through Christ to everyone alive. And who is supposed to make them aware of this? The completely available love and grace of God. We are, Romans 10 and other places. This is the mission of the church, but I'm afraid we stumble for the exact reason that we do not love these people like God does. Am I wrong? Some of them hate us. They hate everything we believe, Pastor. Yes, some of them do. Just like the Samaritans hated the Israelites. Can you love a person who hates you? God does. Jesus did. And we are his ambassadors. Nicodemus was one of these who thought the love of God was only for the few of which he got to be one. But he seemed to home that maybe there was more to the story. He was a truth seeker, meeting Jesus in the night to find out if perhaps he would be able to follow the deep longing of his heart, to believe that Jesus was the Savior, the Christ. By the way, later on after the resurrection, the Bible says Nicodemus came to faith in Jesus. But that night, as a part of trying to open his eyes, Jesus said to him these famous words, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have ever or eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Oh, how radical must this have sounded to the exclusionary Nicodemus. He was one of the chosen few who thought the rest of the world only existed to be judged by God, certainly not to be loved in spite of their sin. But Jesus was so clear with his words. Notice who God so loved. God so loved the world. Wait a minute, says Nicodemus. Don't you mean God so loved the chosen children of Abraham? No, says Jesus. God so loved the world. And notice verse 17. Why did God send his son? Not to condemn the world, but so that they could be saved. And who will be saved? All those who believe. Whosoever believes in the King's English. Whosoever. I don't know why the so in the middle makes it more powerful, but it does whosoever. I do not believe there's anything in the Bible that contradicts what Jesus said 
here. Whether you take me to Romans chapter 9 or Ephesians chapter 1 or wherever else you want to look, there is nothing that is meant to cancel out these words spoken by the Son of God. In fact, I tend to think we ought to go back to what Jesus said if there's ever a question about what is meant somewhere else. Jesus said God so loved the world. He said that he had not come to condemn the world. He essentially said through faith, through believing, anyone can be saved. If you need another verse, check the last page of your Bible where Jesus said, whosoever will may come and drink of the living water, the very water he offered to a particularly sinful Samaritan woman, the water of salvation. See, Jesus offers forgiveness and everlasting life to everyone in the world. Why? Three words, anyone? <laughs> because of love. Think about this. Why would God come down why would he leave heaven to offer salvation to the world? Some are now saying it's only about God's glory. As if bringing glory to himself is the only motivation that God could ever have. And while I would say his glory is his ultimate motivation, my Bible says God sent his son for a very specific reason, and that reason is because of love. God sent his son because he loved me, and he loved you. Even while we were yet sinners, as Romans 5, 8 says. And listen, if Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, maybe we should get a clue that condemning them is not our job either. If Jesus came to offer love to the world, maybe we should do the same. And to do that, we'll probably need to let God take care of the judgment part in his timing. Now listen, I don't feel love for certain people who are saying certain things and doing certain things right now, okay? This goes back to a couple weeks ago when I explained that love is not a feeling. But to be clear, I don't feel love for people on the extremes. How I feel is basically that I just want to yell at some of them, you know? Or at least to get a really mean bumper sticker, okay? Because that, that would do it. Pray God changes my heart. And honestly, he's already been doing so. But right now, the point is this. Jesus loved sinners. He demonstrated love to them. He did not demonstrate anger and hatred towards sinners. But just so you know, you aren't alone. I don't feel love for racists or for militant hyper-feminists or for toxic misogynists for that matter, or for brazen criminals and violent people. I don't feel love for those who hate Christians. I don't feel love right now for those who are screaming their heads off for ab abortion rights, or for those who decide to attack me or who show hatred for me and my God, unless I will agree with them on one issue or another. I don't always feel love for everyone. But here's the thing. God loves me in spite of my sin and see, my sin is just as damning as anyone else's sin. So maybe if God can love me, I can find a way to love them. If God, being perfect, can still love the whole world, surely I, being a sinner, can love them too. If we only love those who love us, we are no different than those who do not have God in their lives. Pretty sure Jesus said something just like that. You know, I find that many amateur theologians are very interested in the wrath of God today rather than his love. Wrath is their favorite word. And make no, make no mistake, wrath is coming for those who do not accept the Lord's Christ. Someday our God who is slow to anger will reach the end of his patience and judgment will come hard. You can find examples of this throughout the Bible, but guess what else you see at all of these points? Even the most godless pagans you can imagine always had an opportunity to repent and believe. Why? Because of love. You see, even when God was in the business of wiping out evil nations, those individuals who chose to put their faith in Israel's God, Yahweh, the Lord, could be spared. Did you know that? Rahab, a prostitute, one you might remember, she turned to God and was spared from his wrath, though it was still poured out on her city. But there were actually others, 
We can read behind the, between the lines later and realize that there were others, and there were entire groups of people who turned to God and were spared in several cases. Especially through the lens of the New Testament and the gospel of Jesus Christ, I've come to see God's wrath not as something He delights in, but as something He would rather avoid. Oh, what a waste. What a waste that the available love of God would be spurned, result in e- resulting in eternal damnation for a soul He loves. This may be radical to some ears, but I believe Jesus showed us God better than any particular theological point someone wants to parse out of the Bible. Jesus came to show us God. And what God did Jesus show us? He showed us a God of love. He showed us a God who would die for our sins and forgive even those who hammered the nails. When in doubt about the love of God, look to the cross. With outstretched arms, Jesus showed us the extent of God's love. And remember this, the very name of Jesus means God saves. Jesus does not mean God condemns or God is prone to wrath or just can't wait to pour out His wrath. Listen, Jesus is the Savior, not the condemner. Yes, I'm fully aware that God is also a just God. So much so that he would die for our sins rather than lower his standard. And yes, his wrath is being stored up to be poured out in the end on all those who reject or ignore his grace. But this is clearly not his preference for any individual person. How do I know this? How can I make such a claim about the nature of God? Only because he has revealed it in his word. The Bible says the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. In another place, the Bible says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. These verses are not unclear about the wishes, desires, and preferences of God. He prefers love. And who does God love? The whole world, all people. And so then, who should we love? Everyone. Some of you have a deeper problem, though. Even some of you who have trusted in Jesus and are following Him have not adequately comprehended or received God's love yourselves. Personally, you still see God as maybe just a little bit malicious, even toward you, his own child. You don't see yourself as his beloved. You just can't quite grasp the fact that God loves you as a son or daughter in spite of your sin. If that's you, listen to these words from John. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. We could spend so much time on every word of this precious passage, but right now, please focus on verse 18. From this verse, I believe the application is this. If, as a believer, you are still frightened of God, living in dread of His punishment, you have not fully understood that God's love was perfected toward you on the cross, completed, finished. You are already forgiven for everything. Perfect love, that is, love that is completely understood and fully received, cast out this kind of fear because this type of fear means you still think God wants to punish you. And that means you really don't understand who God is and what He has done for you, which is to take your punishment upon Himself. The cross was enough. God loves you. Additionally, we see here, as in so many other places, that the love we have for others comes from God. Verse 19, we love because He first loved us. And that brings us back around to our why. Because of love. Because of whose love? Because of God's love. God is love. God loves us in a special way as His believing children. And listen, God loves the rest of the world enough to call us to let Him love them through us. 
What a great job he's given us. I do not believe I will ever err in my efforts to grow your understanding of God's love or his grace. Why? Because the solution is to sin. The solution to sin is not so much being angry or judgmental or even disgusted by it, but rather the solution to sin is the cross. It's just that simple. God changes people and behaviors by the power of the gospel, which is the good news of his grace and his love available to all. Because of Jesus on the cross, God's love is available to you. Now, teaching through Scripture, as I usually do, I will be forced often to point out just how terrible is God's wrath, and it will become clear that eternal damnation in hell is no joke for the unbeliever. But listen, when I talk about these things, I will do so as someone striving to rescue the perishing from the fire, as it says in Jude, not as someone who almost seems to celebrate the fact that some of these people are going to burn. No. No. It is love, not hate, that motivates me to beg people to repent and turn to Jesus Christ, to try my best to persuade them, as Paul said, before it is too late. And let me just correct one other thing while I'm here. I've heard this so many times from so many people. I'm not even sure that I haven't said it myself to my shame. What am I talking about? I've heard people say, if God doesn't destroy Portland... He's going to owe an apology to Sodom and Gomorrah. Most of you know Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed by God with fire and brimstone because of widespread sexual immorality. So what's wrong with the statement? Everything. Everything is wrong with it. First of all, it's an incredibly arrogant statement. God will not be apologizing for anything, ever. And I'm pretty sure he doesn't need us to hold him accountable for consistency. Are we brazen or what? Secondly, read your Bible. God told Abraham he would not destroy Sodom and Gomorrah if there were ten righteous people. That is, believers. Because it's through faith that we're made righteous. If there were ten believers left in the city, in the end, there proved to be less than ten And God rescued those few before destroying it. But Abraham stopped asking at 10. And God said he would not destroy the cities, even if there were 10. Well, folks, there are a lot more than 10 believers left in Portland, okay? So even if we had the right to question God, we'd still be wrong. To think that this would be the attitude of the church today. We say, how could it have come to this about the world? But how could it have come to this in the church? That we would say such things, that we would have such an attitude to ask, why doesn't God destroy an entire city? Because of sin. Could we be more arrogant, more self-righteous, more unloving? To think that anyone could say this around other believers and not face an immediate rebuke. Perhaps once again, we are the blind leading the blind. God help us. As you know, we are planting a church in Portland called Go Church PDX. Our planters are Dustin and Don Payne and their three beautiful children. In fact, Dustin's one-year residency with us here is coming to an end. And so the first Sunday in September, we will be officially sending them out with our prayers and ongoing support. Up to now, they've been doing groundwork, but soon they'll be preparing for launching the church to have weekly services probably in the next six months or so. Now, why do you think they're here? Why did they come out here from Texas where they had an amazing house in a quiet suburb and where they enjoyed a great life to live in the heart of Portland to try to reach some part of the city with the gospel of Jesus Christ. What motivated them? Why did they do it? Well, it's because of love. They were not okay with standing by to wait and see if God would destroy Portland. No, they moved in with their family and they started loving people. And right now, they've gathered a small group of folks who have come around them to help start a new church. And I can tell you those people are there because of love. For the people of Portland, can you imagine? We got some attitude issues. You know we do. 
I'll also tell you this. If it were not for love, Christy and I would not be here planning this church either. When we say because of love, it's the truth. We left a lot behind. We laid down a very successful position leading a large church with a ton of upward mobility, as they say, to come here and start something tiny, seemingly insignificant to a lot of people. God's blessed and that's changing. But why the risk and the significant personal cost? Why all this work? Why another church? Why Ridgefield? Why a vision for a network of churches in the Northwest? Why now? Because of love. Love for you and love for the people we hope to bring to Jesus so they can exchange wrath and judgment for eternity with God. We are doing all of this because of love. Love for Jesus and love for the people who need Him. We simply cannot stand by and do nothing while so many perish. We must tell them about eternal life in Christ because of love. So, as I wrap up, let's dream a little. What if the G church of Jesus Christ became known for love again? What if Go Church was known for love? Can we not love and hold to the truth at the same time? Oh, believe me, it's a challenge. And some on both sides will try not to allow it. But we need to meet this challenge head on. And notice I didn't say everyone will love us because our love doesn't mean we will say or do whatever they want. And so they may place ultimatives on receiving our love and they may not love us, but their response is not in our control. I wonder though if our neighbors, our communities, and if the people of the world even realize we offer love, either our own or God's. What if the church was known for love again? Not at the expense of truth, but what if we led with love? It goes deeper, doesn't it? What if we actually loved people? What if we tried a little bit harder on this point? What if we stopped giving up? When did you give up? Can you trace it back? Has anyone else been giving up? on loving the world, the people in the world, I should say? Anybody just got, finally just gave in to negative emotions, letting them rule you? Has anyone else given in to feelings of anything but love for the people of the world? I'd encourage you to do what I'm doing. Turn away from that and ask God for forgiveness and for help because this is not going to be easy. Does everybody understand what I'm asking for you to do? I'm asking to get back to love and to crucify the fear, anger, and hate while you're at it. So let's spend some time in prayer and help you find a come to Jesus moment right now because this is going to require his help. Let's pray. Lord, I preach this message knowing at least for the next week or two, it's going to be ringing in my own ears in the moments when I'm not practicing what I preached. It's tough. We have reasons to be upset. But you've called us to a different level of maturity, I think, than many of us have been walking in. Change our hearts. Help us be more like you. Let us remember our mission and that our mission starts with love and sharing the truth in love. There's so much temptation, God, to overreact in the church today. There's a, gr there's, there's a group of people out there that are looking for... A, basically a mean church. We could grow this church by being meaner. Help us. Help us find the true, the place you want us to be where we don't sacrifice the truth, but we don't sacrifice love either. It's tough. We need your help.
Father, today I pray for anyone in this room who has never had that initial moment of receiving your love by faith in Jesus Christ. That moment of understanding at a deeper level for the first time that Jesus was God and he died on a cross to pay the price, not just for the sins of the world, but for my sin. And that I need to receive that gift and receive salvation from him. And my life will never be the the, the same. That I will change, that I'm repenting of my old life, that I'm turning to a new life. I'm giving my life to Christ. That somebody today maybe even would have that moment of saying yes to what you've offered, the forgiveness, a new life in Christ. Thank you for what happened this last week at youth camp. Thank you for saving people this last week that somebody, that more than one, has moved from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. We rejoice with the angels today. And even in this room right now, maybe that would happen in somebody's life by the power of the Holy Spirit and your conviction that someone would turn today and turn to Jesus knowing that you will take us the rest of the way and trusting you with that. In his name I pray. Amen. Well, as we sing this song, um, please prayerfully respond to what God has said today. And if anybody needs prayer or would like to share a decision, um, I see it's Frank and Jan today and, and Susan. Uh, We've got leaders in the back. We call it a a reverse altar call, okay? You can go to the back for prayer or to share a decision while we sing. And the rest of you, let's just be in prayer and respond to God. We always want to have a chance to respond to God's Word. Amen? So stand up with me as we sing. Give you my life. I give you my trust. Jesus You are my God And you are enough Jesus Oh Jesus My heart is yours My heart is yours Take it all, take it all My life in your hands My heart is yours My heart is yours Take it all, take it all My life in your hands I lay down my
in your hands Take it all, take it all My life in your 